Sinna, then Jason. Then Jason. Then me. Then Sina. Then Jason. Good evening, and welcome to tonight's debate between the major party candidates seeking to represent Ohio's first congressional district. I'm Burl Love, and I'm the editor of the Cincinnati Enquirer and regional editor of the USA Today Network Ohio. We are pleased to sponsor tonight's debate along with our partners, Fox 19, the Cincinnati USA Regional Chamber, the African American Chamber of Greater Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky, and of course, our host, the University of Cincinnati. Each candidate has agreed to the format and ground rules tonight. Now it's time to, time to go over the ground rules for you, the audience. We ask that audience members refrain from cheering, applause, and all other forms of crowd noise during the debate. You will have the opportunity to make some noise at the conclusion of tonight's debate and in a moment when we welcome our candidates to the stage. We also ask that you refrain from entering and exiting the uh, auditorium during the debate. And finally, we ask that members of the audience remain civil and respectful. This is a debate, not a rally, and anyone unable to follow the rules will be asked to leave. Tonight's debate is being streamed live on Cincinnati.com and Fox19.com, 
and Fox 19 will air the debate Saturday at 5.30 a.m. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator tonight, Fox 19 evening anchor, Trisha Mackey. From the University of Cincinnati, the Ohio First District Congressional Debate, here is Fox 19 Now's Trisha Mackey. Somebody's always talking to me in my ear. That's just the way it is. How's everybody doing tonight? You doing well? Thank you so much for being here. And as you know, we are just days away from learning who will serve Ohio's first congressional district. As you, the voters, will go to the polls to decide one of the most closely watched races in the nation. Wouldn't you agree? We are partnering, as Burl said, with the Cincinnati Enquirer, the Cincinnati Chamber of Commerce, the African American Chamber of Commerce, and the University of Cincinnati to bring you this debate between Republican incumbent Steve Shabbat and Democrat Hamilton County Clerk of Courts Abtab Purval. We wanted to introduce you to the panelists. This one-hour debate will focus on quite a lot of topics, actually, from the future of our nation, from our panelists. So please welcome political columnist Jason Williams of the Cincinnati Enquirer. President, there you go, Jason. I read his stuff too all the time. President and CEO of the Cincinnati USA Regional Chamber, Jill Meyer. And University of Cincinnati student body president, Sina Hablasi. I hope I came close. Right now I would like to introduce Burl Love, editor of the Cincinnati Enquirer, who is going to go over the debate rules. Thank you, Trisha. Thank you, Trisha. So on behalf of the Enquirer and the USA Today Network and our partners, I'd like to thank the candidates for their participation tonight. And here are the ground rules. When one of our panelists asks a question, each candidate will answer that same question. We'll rotate the order of their responses. Each candidate will have up to two minutes to respond. With 30 seconds remaining, and again at 10 seconds remaining, they will hear this bell. If they go over their allotted time, Trisha will jump in to keep it moving. The candidates also will have the option for a brief rebuttal. And should the candidates veer off topic, Trisha will politely nudge them back to the question. We will have closing statements from the candidates at the end of the debate. And now finally, to introduce our candidates, back to Trisha. In lieu of opening statements, we are going to introduce the candidates with a brief biography, beginning with Abtab Purval. Abtab Purval is the Hamilton County Clerk of Courts and the first Democrat to be elected to that office in over 100 years. Purval was born and raised in Ohio, attended the Ohio State University and the University of Cincinnati College of Law. He also served as a special assistant U.S. attorney. He and his wife, Whitney, live in Cincinnati. Congressman Steve Shabbat is serving Ohio's first congressional district in his 11th term. Before being elected to Congress in 1994, Shabbat served as both a Cincinnati City Council member and a Hamilton County Commissioner. He taught political science at the University of Cincinnati and shared the Boy Scouts of Cincinnati. He and his wife, Donna, live in the Cincinnati neighborhood of Westwood. So now let's welcome the candidates. System. Right there. Good job. Thanks, everybody. We'd like to thank our audience and ask again that from here on out that you hold your applause until the end of the debate. We do appreciate it. Now, we want to jump right into the questions. Our first question comes from a viewer, and based on a coin toss, Congressman Shabbat will answer, for, answer first. Congressman, gun violence and domestic terrorism continue to be hot topics. In recent day, a gunman opened fire, killing 11 worshipers inside a Pittsburgh synagogue. Just last month, three people were killed in a shooting at Cincinnati's Fountain Square. In light of these shootings, Kevin R. asks, what is your position on gun control and how should the Second Amendment be interpreted in the 21st century? Okay, well, thank you all for being here this evening. I want to thank the sponsors. And related to that, I'd like to ask uh, for a moment of silence to honor and remember the innocent people who lost their lives or were wounded at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh over the weekend.
Thank you very much. Now, relative to the, the question itself, gun violence is a continuing problem in this country. We absolutely do have to do something about it. I happen to be on the Judiciary Committee, and that's the committee where the action is on this uh, issue. I am not necessarily for uh, additional gun control legislation because it doesn't make us safer as a society. We need to enforce those laws which are on the books uh, right now. When we pass new gun control laws, what they tend to do uh, is they affect the law-abiding citizens of our nation and their Second Amendment rights. What they don't do is uh, have much effect at all on the criminals. Uh, that's why we call them criminals, because they're not going to obey new laws that we pass. But it is a problem we need to continue to work on it. I worked with Dan Hills, the FOP chairman, after the Parkland shooting. We passed legislation which is hardening our schools, making them safer. Um, let me uh, say something else. The, the Enquirer recently suggested that Mr. Pureval and I take the high road. Uh, in light of recent events, I think they're right. Uh, in the interest of improving civility, I'm going to make an offer uh, to Mr. Pureval. Um, and uh, if you're willing to do the same, uh, I will not criticize you this evening at all. I'll talk about the issues. I'll talk about what I've done, um, what I intend to do uh, in the future. Uh, in fact, I'll go a step further. Uh, I will order that all my television ads from here to the end of this election uh, will be nothing but positive. We will not mention you by name or my opponent did this or that or the other. Um, and uh, we can control our own campaigns even though we can't control the outside groups. I hope you'll accept this. And knowing the people of this community as, as I do, um, I, I think that they would uh, welcome this. So uh, it's made in good faith. I have no alternative motives at all. Um, I think that more civility in this race, maybe we can set an example for other races. Congressman, thank you. Mr. Perval? Thank you so much for the question. Uh, this past week has been tragic. First, the, the bomb scares to government leaders in our country, and now the horrific tragedy in, in Pittsburgh at the synagogue, where folks who were praying uh, and being in the community peacefully were slaughtered. An absolute tragedy. But what's worse is the, the hate in the perpetrator's heart, screaming anti-Semitic epithets while murdering so many. But unfortunately, the tragedy in Pittsburgh has become all too commonplace. Enough is enough. Our leaders in Washington have to take a stand, have to have some moral courage on this issue. Because time and time again, whether in our places of worship or in our schools, in our communities, on our streets, this senseless gun violence has gone unanswered. After Columbine, after Parkland, after Sandy Hook, after Cincinnati. And might I remind you, that happened in a bank, one of the most, most guarded establishments in our community. Our leaders have done nothing. But what's even more frustrating is a majority of Americans agree on the way forward on this issue, they agree that we need to have a ban on bump stocks, a ban on high-capacity magazines, that we, we genuinely need real universal background checks to make sure that guns don't get into the hands of dangerous people. And yes, we need to ban military-style assault weapons. They're not used for self-defense. They're not used for hunting. They're used for killing people. And certainly in Pittsburgh, we saw that law enforcement report, reports say that the tragedy was so severe, that the loss of life was so dramatic because of a military-style assault weapon. We have to have leaders who will stand up to the gun lobby. Send me to Congress, and that's exactly what I'll do. Mr. Proval, thank you so much. Thank you. I, I didn't hear an answer to my, to my uh, offer, so I'm going to... I was actually so going gonna... to just um, point that out. Congressman, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, I know that we have seen, even on Fox 19, I've seen a lot of commercials both ways. Um, both a negative and positive. I wanted to answer the, the yes. question asked, but mm -hmm. Mr. Shabbat, uh, absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm proud of the, the campaign that I'm running. I'm going to consistently and continue to run a positive campaign. Tonight on this debate stage, uh, I will talk about the areas where we disagree, but I will not attack you personally. Okay. I will not do that. Guys, and that's going to make my you, job so much easier tonight. You, you, you've got mine as well, right. and I think I have 30 seconds of rebuttal okay. um, as the first question. Is that right? Yes, you do. Okay. Um, I just wanted to talk about what we did do um, relative to Parkland, for example. Uh, I met with Dan Hill, who's the head of the FOP. I'm endorsed by the FOP in this race, if you want to know where folks who care about the security in our, our community are. 
And uh, we introduced legislation that will allow retired police officers uh, to now be in our schools. Schools don't have to have them. They're retired police officers we have like here in Cincinnati and it'll be across the nation. Also uh, training for school personnel, uh, for teachers to know uh, what's happening out there, how they can identify the problem students, and so we're going to make our schools safer for our children. Congressman, thank you so much. Jason Williams, you have the first question. Uh, this, is for, uh, this is for Congressman Shabbat. Um, Congressman Shabbat, please clearly state your stance on health care and whether you support pre-existing conditions. In your answer, please clarify the action steps you would take to ensure health care, health coverage for those individuals and to lower premiums for middle-class Americans. Okay, yes, I do. Uh, favor have voted for coverage for pre-existing condition coverage for health care. Um, I'm for access to quality, affordable health care for all Americans. Um, I do think that doctors and patients ought to be the ones making the decisions about health care in this country, uh, not the bureaucrats uh, in, in Washington. Um, and relative to the uh, uh, to pre-existing conditions, um, obviously uh, there has been some controversy. I'm being very careful how, here about how I talk about this. Uh, there have been allegations that a number of us voted against that. And I can't speak for everybody else, but I can tell you uh, what my uh, vote meant. Um, I felt that the American people deserve something better than Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act or what some people call it the Unaffordable uh, Care Act. One of the conditions in there was pre-existing condition coverage as well as coverage for 20 uh, on your uh, insurance coverage on your children up to 26. Both of those on their own I would have supported. We didn't get a chance to vote for those on their own. In fact, I wasn't even in Congress when Obamacare passed. That was the two years I was out of office. Um, so, but that wasn't the package. The package was essentially a government takeover of health care. Um, that's what I opposed. I, in, I can't tell you how much speeches I gave saying I wanted to repeal Obamacare and replace it with something better. Um, that's what we attempted to do. Uh, we attempted to replace it with the American Health Care Act. That's what I voted for. It also had pre-existing condition coverage in it. So that's the controversy. Some folks will say, oh, they voted against pre-existing condition coverage. One can make that argument. I don't think it's accurate. It's certainly not fully accurate because we said we'd replace it and the bill that we passed or in the House did cover pre-existing conditions. Unfortunately, as we all know, Senator McCain famously went over and gave the thumbs down um, and it didn't become law. So if you're not satisfied with health care right now, we're under Obamacare, not the bill that we passed. Congressman, thank you. This is an issue where Mr. Shabbat and I just disagree. I don't believe there's a controversy about pre-existing conditions. Mr. Shabbat's voting record speaks, speaks for itself. He voted repeatedly to strip protections for those with pre-existing conditions. I say so, the Inquirer says so, and PolitiFact says so. Uh, and this is an important issue facing a lot of people in our district because premiums are going up. For families, it's gone up nearly $3,000. For individuals, it's gone up nearly $1,000. We're pricing people out of affordable health care. And on top of that, drug prices go up and up and up every single year, unchecked. My opponent, Mr. Shabbat, voted against a bill that would enable uh, the federal government to use its bargaining power to drive down those drug prices and as a result drive down those health care costs. Uh, and it's because he's taken hundreds of thousands of dollars from big drug companies. We just have a legitimate practical and policy disagreement on those issues. I think we have to have leaders who will stand up for folks with pre-existing conditions, who will stand up to the, to the big drug lobby in order to drive down premiums and in order to drive down drug costs. Uh, Mr. Shabbat has had an, opportun uh, an opportunity to do that. He's been in Congress since 1994, and over and over again, he's failed us on this issue. I think we need to come together and provide real steps forward to expand the Medicare buy-in by at least 10 years to ensure that we expand coverage and also make sure uh, that we take high-risk high patients out of the general pool to, again, reduce costs. That's a common-sense bipartisan solution that's on the table we need to start electing leaders who will bring people together and drive those results. Um, Jason, are you satisfied? I, I have a. I, I do believe first, you do get a rebuttal yeah, after the for first this. time. Yes. Um, relative to, uh, I think this rule of not attacking the other has already been violated. 
Um, relative to my opponent, um, his, the plan that he is in favor of, his ultimate goal is something called Medicare for All. It would cost $32 trillion. It would have to double our income taxes. We would lose our existing health care coverage, and it would be a great threat to Medicare. So it's a very dangerous plan uh, that he says is his ultimate goal. I think that would be very bad for the country, and that's why I oppose that. I think we need to fix the health care that we have in our country now, and I'm intending, uh, if I'm back there again, to do that. Mr. Pierval, you'll be answering the next question. Jill, you're up. Thank you. Talent attraction, development, and retention are all keys to ensure we have a workforce equipped for the jobs of today and tomorrow. What will you do in Congress to increase the size, skill level, and diversity of our region's talent pool? Thank you for that question. And, and to address Mr. Shabbat's uh, rebuttal, I, I, don't, I don't stand for Medicare for All. What I stand for uh, is making sure that our health care system is f uh, affordable and quality for everybody. Uh, and I don't believe it's an attack to say that Mr. Shabbat has taken hundreds of thousands of dollars from the drug lobby. That's, that's just something that we disagree on. I've not taken any corporate PAC money because I want people in the 1st Congressional District to know that I represent them and that I have their interests at heart. To the question about uh, retaining and recruiting diverse talent, I know this personally. I worked at Procter & Gamble. I was the global brand attorney for Olay for several years. I know how difficult it is to recruit and attract uh, really good talent here in our community, but most importantly, to retain that talent. And I think a lot of that has to do with the leadership of the Chamber of Commerce, hand in glove with leadership from state leaders, from local leaders, and yes, from federal leaders. Because we have to create a Cincinnati that is inclusive, where everyone feels welcome, where families, young and old, where diverse communities can come, where the LGBT community can feel welcomed uh, and feel celebrated. I think this, the Cincinnati has taken great strides in order to do that, uh, but we can do so much more. Uh, we, can, we, can, we can lead on this issue, uh, not only in our rhetoric, but also in the laws that we pass from the federal level, the state level, and also the local level. Uh, I know that because at Procter & Gamble, I've had friends who have uh, decided to leave Cincinnati uh, because they didn't feel welcome. There's more we can do on this, on this issue, and I look forward to, to, to serving in Congress and doing it. Yeah, he says he hasn't violated the rule, yet he says that I voted the way I did on health care because I've taken all this money from the health care industry. That's completely, that's not the way I operate. That may be the way that you operate. I do what I think is best for the people that I represent and the country. People contribute, that happens, absolutely. But I do what I say, and then it attracts sometimes funding for campaigns. And if you want to talk about campaign funding, you've raised probably three times what I have. I thought we had a pretty good quarter. We had our best quarter last time in quite some time, about $400,000. You raised $1.6 million. So if you talk about money flowing in, it's been mostly in, on, on your side. Now, relative to workforce development, et cetera, absolutely critical. Um, I happen to be the chairman of the House Small Business Committee, and I visit a lot of companies in our district right here in the greater Cincinnati area. Um, I do it around the country uh, as well as chair. We'll go into a district, we'll visit a number of, of places. And what I've heard from small business owners over and over and over again is we're having trouble hiring people. Now, the economy is doing very well right now. Um, you know, we've got about a 3.7% uh, unemployment rate. We have, more pe we have more jobs available than there are people seeking those jobs. So we have to train the folks uh, to be uh, available and ready to take those jobs. One other thing I hear a lot is that I have to have somebody that will show up and be able to pass a drug test. The opioid problem in our community and communities all over the country is just devastating. And that's wreaking havoc on a whole range of things. And we actually had a hearing in the, in the Small Business Committee uh, th that I chair on this topic, what we can do about the opioid uh, problem. We need to train folks here. We've got some great schools. When you look at uh, the Great Oaks schools in, in, uh, in Warren County, we've got the Warren County Career Center. I visited and worked with those folks time and time again. So we've got to train, get the kids ready, and those that are seeking employment so they're ready to fill those jobs. Yeah, I, 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 I'll take credit for uh, having a successful campaign. I'm, I'm proud of the fact that a lot of folks from across the district 
uh, across the region are excited about this campaign and, and contributing small amounts, small dollar amounts to the, to the campaign. Uh, and as a result, we have the resources to compete. I'm, I'm proud of the support that we're gaining, grassroots support all across the district. And on this, on this topic, uh, Mr. Shabbat doesn't have any ideas. He doesn't have any plans uh, because uh, he's, he's for the status quo. Uh, he's been in Congress for a very long time. He's had an opportunity to address the, the challenge that we have with recruiting and retaining diverse talent. Uh, and unfortunately, he's, he's been nowhere to be found on this issue. Congressman Shabbat, you're going to be answering the next question from Sina. With, with the need for highly skilled talent in our workforce, would you support eliminating caps on H-1B visas to allow it? Could you repeat that again? Sure, yeah. With the need for highly skilled talent in our workforce, would you support eliminating caps on H-1B visas to allow individuals with bachelor's degrees or equivalent to come to the United States to work? And what about finding solutions for the DACA program? I've yes, been, I've, as far as the first part, yes, I've been supportive of that for, for quite some time. Um, we need to train the American people, first of all, uh, to be ready to fill those jobs. But the fact is, uh, we have had folks coming from different parts of the world that have the skills um, that, that we need here. Oftentimes, they tend to be pretty technical skills or, uh, or their, their tech skills that we don't necessarily have enough people that have been trained here. I think it makes a lot of sense, for example. Um, we have people that graduate from the engineering school. You see where we're at tonight has one of the best engineering schools in the nation, bar none. And I've, I've gone through there, toured it, seen the students, talked to the professors many times over the years. Um, and some of those students are from other countries. And they'll come here, and we have a policy right now where we're not very welcoming. These are oftentimes people that can start new businesses that, and, and you have some folks that say, well, we don't, you know, they're from another country, we don't want them here. You know, we want the Americans to get the jobs first. The reality is if these folks are going to start a business, they're hiring Americans. So it's good for all of us. So we really do have to have policies in place. And I've been working on these policies for years now um, and will continue to do so. So thank you for asking that question. Congressman, just to be um, clear, so the, the first part of that question was, would you support eliminating caps on H-1B visas to allow individuals with a bachelor's degree or come to come to the United States? And the answer was, the short answer? Yes. Yes, okay. Mr. Perval? Yeah, my, my two answers to the, to the direct question are yes and yes. We absolutely uh, need to, to lift those, uh, those limits, and we have to do something about the dreamers who we've committed, uh, that if they come out of the shadows, uh, that we can make a place for them. But the question is a good one because it highlights the fact that our immigration system in our country is utterly broken and that the leaders we've sent to Washington, D.C. to fix it have had their opportunity time and time again, and they've failed. The path forward is very clear. We need comprehensive, bipartisan, and common sense solutions to immigration. It starts with the border. We have to strengthen our border with 21st century technology to make sure that we're keeping people who are dangerous and unproductive out of our country. Second, we have to make a place for those who are here, who want to work for it, who are productive and law-abiding. We have to make a pathway to citizen citizenship for them. And, and, and on the DACA kids, we have to absolutely fulfill our commitment to these children. The promise that we made them, that if they come out of the shadows, uh, that if they, if they raise their hand and, and are held accountable, that we can make a place for them here. These are folks, these are children who have come to this country through no fault of their own. They serve in our military. They, they serve as first responders. They are productive folks in our community. And in order to remain strong, we have to have a comprehensive immigration system that works, that recruits and retains top talent from across the world. It's important for our economy, but it's also important for what's a, what makes us uniquely American. Yeah, Mr. Pierval says he wants to uh, have secure borders, but in fact, he's in favor of a couple of policies which are just the opposite. One is supporting sanctuary cities. In other words, people that are here illegally and the like Cincinnati is one of these areas under city council, which was, I think, a, a mistake 
basically say you're not going to cooperate with ICE officials and these people can be turned out into the streets and could be a danger to our communities. Uh, and he's basically for amnesty too, which I think is a big mistake. And I think as we all know, we have a caravan that's heading up here right now. I think it's very dangerous for our, for our, our country and we need to make sure that this is dealt with appropriately. We're a compassionate nation, but at the same time, we need to control our borders. Congressman, thank you. Jason. I have a, I have a uh, Campaign-related questions, one each for uh, each candidate. And I'll start with Congressman Shabbat. Um, Congressman, a Republican PAC linked uh, Mr. Pureball to terrorists in a nasty attack ad. Do you condone this? Uh, no, I don't condone ads that we don't run. I think if you look at the facts, however, um, Mr. Pureball ran an ad. I've never run a 60-second ad before, but he ran an ad, 60 seconds, because he, he had to introduce himself to the community. Talked about every place he'd gone to school, every job that he had held, except for one, which was the job he held for the longest term that he's ever held, which was four years, for a Washington lobbying firm uh, called White and & Case. And they have some pretty despicable clients. And he'll say, well, I, you know, I didn't represent those folks, but he was in the division with the folks that did represent them, and they've maxed out to his campaign. They've given large contributions uh, to him. And these, pay, these organizations, for example, represented, uh, uh, for example, the, the terrorist organizations uh, that killed American citizens, they represent the governments that were being sued. They represented the, the, uh, the governments that were being sued by American victims of those terrorist attacks. That's the type of people uh, that this firm represented. Now, you can look it up. All the facts are there. I probably wouldn't have put Gaddafi's face on there. They did that. Um, but again, this, this wasn't our, our ad. Um, and they also, um, interestingly enough, um, they represent literally Putin's government. And in what cases? Well, in reaction to that, to uh, to the Russians uh, doing all kinds of stuff that we've complained about, uh, we essentially closed down a number of their facilities in the United States. And they represented Putin against us shutting down those facilities for basically doing things against the United States, which we felt were, was inappropriate. So they represent Putin's government. Uh, I could go on and on about some of, the uh, some of the people they represent. So would I have run that ad? Probably not, because I didn't think it was particularly effective. Um, I did. What do you mean I ran that ad? That wasn't me running the ad. That's just wrong. I didn't run the ad. The, the ad was run by, I think, CLF or one of the other entities. We're going to give, um, can you please reframe uh, the audience so we can keep this going? We're going to give you a little bit of time to um, rebut. Yeah, it's, what you just saw there is why our country's broken. What you just saw there is why Republicans and Democrats can't work together. From the same man who started this debate with a pledge not to personally attack, to hear that come out of his mouth, it's why Republicans and Democrats can't work together and accomplish anything in Washington, D.C. It's why D.C. needs to change, because career politicians think they can get elected by dividing us, think it doesn't matter that after over two decades they've accomplished very little for their community, because they can just get up here on this debate stage and point fingers, personal attacks, and smears. This is not going to change unless we change the people that we send right, there. Thank you. Jason, you have another question direct. I do. I do. Um, this is for Mr. Pierreval. Um Many Democrats, Republicans, and the media have questioned why you have continued to double down on your campaign finance error. It's a cloud that's hovered over your campaign for nearly three months. Why didn't you simply own the mistake, correct it, and move on? Thank you, Jason. I, this campaign issue, um, I, I agree, has been, has been pending. Uh, but it's important to know that a majority of the complaints filed against our campaign have been dismissed as utterly baseless. There is one issue that, is, that continues to pen, and it's about a poll, a poll that we took in the early part of the year to decide whether a congressional campaign made sense or whether we should stay put as the Hamilton County Clerk of Courts. We reached out to the experts. We asked our lawyers, how do we pay for it? They suggested paying for it out of, partly out of our local account and partly out of our federal account. And that's exactly what we did because we were trying to stay true to the letter and the spirit of the law. Now, if that turns out to be incorrect, Jason, I will stand up immediately and say that it was incorrect and remedy the, remedy the situation. 
But this issue isn't going to be, this campaign isn't going to be decided on this issue. It's going to be decided on the big issues that are facing the people of the first congressional district, whether they can afford their premiums, whether they're children who have pre-existing conditions like asthma and cancer can get the treatment that they need, whether good paying jobs are going to stay here in our community, whether they can get to work safely over the Western Hills viaduct. That's going to dictate the, the winner and loser of this campaign and, frankly, this debate. The second part of his question um, was, why don't you simply own the mistake, correct it, and move on? Do you believe that, are, are you owning the mistake? I will own the mistake. If it turns out that we did something improperly, I'll stand up and say we were wrong and remedy the situation immediately. But again, that, that issue is still pending right now. But again, I, I hope this debate and I hope the rest of this campaign are focused on those issues that are really confronting the people of the first district. I offered to make this a, uh, a, uh, one that we could be kind of proud of. And uh, unfortunately, uh, you've dragged it back into some charges, et cetera. Um, the, the bottom line is this campaign, Mr. Pierval's campaign, uh, has, I, I've never seen a campaign like this before. Um, today, for example, uh, there were criminal charges probably uh, that are going to be filed ultimately. Um, but Saturday, I'm trying to think, it was Saturday about a week ago. Essentially what happened is they uh, sent a spy out to me to find out what I was going to say in the, in the next debate, what my strategy was posing, you know, as, as one of our people in the campaign shirt, and it's been one sleazy thing after another. It's really unfortunate because it should be about what's in the best interest of this community and what can we do moving forward. That's what it ought to be about. Congressman, thank you. Jill, you have the next question. Thank you. Thank you. Whether, it's Whether it's major projects like the Brent Spence Bridge or the Western Hills Viaduct or the nearly 50 percent of streets in the city of Cincinnati that are in fair or worse condition, it is no secret that infrastructure investment is critical to the district and has bipartisan support. What can we expect you to do in the coming session to move an infrastructure bill in partnership with the White House and the other party? And as part of your answer, if you would address, local governments have been required to commit significantly more resources to transportation projects in hopes of winning increasingly competitive federal grants. What have you done, or what would you do in Washington to assist in our local efforts? Okay, thank you. Well, I'm going to continue to push for projects, infrastructure projects, which I think are in the best interest of this community. Now, it's the local, folk, pro, uh, the local folks who decide what those priorities are. To just give you a list of some things that we've been able to accomplish over the years, uh, the I-75 and I-71 corridor uh, improvements. Sometimes it can be a hassle because you've got barrels out there, but we have to do that, and it's a lot of federal money, millions and millions of dollars of federal money that we've been able to get. The Fort Washington Way, which is the connection between downtown Cincinnati and the riverfront. Those riverfront uh, parks uh, themselves that we work uh, to get money through the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, Martin Luther King Interchange, not too far from here, that's going to mean major development uh, in this area up here. The Galbeth Road uh, flyover, which hasn't been built yet, but we got the money uh, sitting uh, waiting there. The, the banks, the street grid down in, in the banks uh, area, and, and a whole range of other things. A Wald Vogel Viaduct, which connects to people of, of Price Hill. Um, now, we brought in uh, Transportation Secretary Elaine Chow recently and met with the chamber folks, with uh, Mayor Cranley and, and other folks to try to strategize on how we can move forward on the Western Hills Viaduct and the Brent Spence uh, Bridge, which we're doing. We got $53 million so far, so far for, uh, for the Brent Spence Bridge, uh, but that's not going to pay for it. We need to do a lot more. Um, I was able to get into the most recent transportation uh, bill, something called Projects of National and Regional Significance. It's a pot of money which is there. It's pretty much got the Brent Spence uh, Bridge name on it. Um, now others can compete too, but in order to get that money, the local community, I mean the state of Ohio, the state of Kentucky, ODOT and others, city of Cincinnati, have to decide how they're going to fund the local portion of that because it isn't going to be paid altogether by the federal government over the local folks. So we're going to work in a bipartisan manner to get all these projects done as we have in the past. Thank you, Congressman. Mr. Perval. I agree with Mr. Shabbat. We need to do a lot more. 
Unfortunately, with Mr. Shabbat in Congress, that hasn't been possible because he hasn't prioritized the Western Hills Viaduct, the Brent Spence Bridge, and so many other transporta transportation challenges facing our community. This has to be a priority. It has to be a priority, whomever is in Congress. And in Congress, I will make it a priority because the, the Western Hills Viaduct is literally raining concrete. For the last 12 years, it's been found to be structurally unsound. And again, Mr. Shabbat has had an opportunity to do anything about it. The Inquirer just wrote an editorial saying that it was an albatross around his neck. Mr. Shabbat talks about working with Mayor Cranley. Well, he just published an editorial with so many of our other local leaders saying that Mr. Shabbat has been missing in action on this issue. We need strong leadership to drive resources back to our community. Right now, we only get 52 cents on the dollar for the taxes that we're sending to Washington, D.C. Those dollars are going for infrastructure projects in Kentucky, in Indiana, but not here at home. We need strong leadership that's on the right committee. First and foremost, I'll be on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, not on the Foreign Affairs Committee like Mr. Shabbat flying around the world. I'll be in D.C. fighting for your dollars to come back here. The second thing I'll do is actually local, partner with local elected leaders like Mayor Cranley, like the commissioners, like city council, to come up with strategic and persuasive ways to win these Tiger Grant funds. These are federal funds used to invest in infrastructure projects exactly like the Western Hills Viaduct. Mr. Cranley's signature was on that application. Mr. Shabbat's wasn't. And the last thing I'll say is Mr. Shabbat in our last campaign uh, debate made a joke about the Western Hills Viaduct. That should tell you everything about how he prior prioritizes it and whether he believes it should be fixed. That's just foolish. Um, you know, when you uh, look at this, this gentleman here and he talks about the Western Hills Viaduct, he doesn't know what he's talking about in this or other infrastructure projects because he wasn't here, didn't live here, moved into our district one day before he announced he was going to represent us. In fact, he wanted to represent the second district and found out this was a more democratic district. He acts like he cares about us and everything. The bottom line is, he doesn't care about us. He wants to be in Congress. It doesn't matter a whole lot on who he's representing or where the heck they are. The Cook political report this morning called him a young man in a hurry. And that's the bottom line is he's a young man in the hurry who wants to uh, polish his resume. Uh, he's just kind of passing through here is what he's doing. I'm committed for the long term, as he'll remind you, 22 years. Jill, since that was such a long question, I just want to make sure that you're satisfied with those answers. Yes, yes thank you. Okay. Your question is up next. Thank you. How do you plan to make college education more accessible and affordable to all of the citizens in Cincinnati? A city home to two elite universities. What was the last part? Of A city home to two elite universities. A city home to city elite home universities? To universities. Two. two. We've actually got more than that. We've got Hebrew Union and we've got this Mount St. Joe's. And, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. apologize. Yeah, it's okay. Um, Mr. Perval, your question, uh, your answer is first on this one. Do you need it repeated again? Or are you okay? I'm, I'm good. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I, I agree. We have to make sure that higher education, that two-year institutions, that colleges are more affordable for everyone. And, and again, this is an issue that's personal to me and it's personal to my wife. I'm st we are still paying off our student loans. When I was going to college here in Ohio, I think tuition was around $5,000. Now it's, it's over doubled that. And when you put in the, the cost of living, it's, it's something like $20,000. We are pricing people out of getting an education, which affects our economy, affects so many aspects of our country. It's part of the reason why home ownership is down. It's part of the reason why folks are waiting to have children until their mid-30s. And it has to change. I'll do several things. But first and foremost, the federal government shouldn't be profiting off of student loans. We have to make sure that students can borrow money at the same rates that banks do, or at least pass legislation saying that they should be borrowing money at the same rates as mortgage rates. I'll also expand Pell Grants. Again, this is an issue that's personal to me. It affects my generation a great deal. And what we need is a new generation of leadership, people who are close to this issue, who have experienced it, who understand the crippling debt and how that can frustrate finding a job and starting a career. People like my opponent, Mr. Shabbat, who just celebrated his 22 years in Congress with, with very little to show for it, he's just out of touch on this issue. And, and that's not just me saying that, that's his track record. He's done nothing to make college more affordable since being in office since 1994. Like this issue and so many others, I think we can do better. In fact, we have to do better for the future of our region. 
Congressman? Yeah, he just said that this issue is personal to him because he had tuition. It's pretty personal to us, too. My wife and I uh, put two of our kids through college, one of them through the DAP program right here at Uni University of uh, Cincinnati. Um, and tuition is becoming a burden. It literally can be 100000 or more. Uh, to, to, and having that burden on you for years and years and years is, is a big problem. Um, I happen to be a, a former school teacher. I taught, uh, after I graduated from college, uh, I taught at St. Joseph's School right down the street from, from Taft High School uh, and was an adjunct professor here, and I, I lost, as you might know. Uh, and uh, so for two years was doing other things, the Boy Scouts and other things. One of them was being an adjunct professor here in the political science department at University of Cincinnati. And the kids would talk about their, their, the amount of debt that they had uh, hanging over their heads. And one of the big problems, we've seen it get worse, not better. Um, Mr. Purevall says it's my fault because I've been in Congress, so obviously it has to be my fault. Um, but the previous administration, the Obama administration, they essentially took the competition out of tuition uh, here in our nation. The government took over tuition and said, this is what it's going to be. Now, if you know anything about, about uh, economics, which I took in, in college years ago, um, competition is a good thing. It keeps prices down. Um, and because the government now has been pushing so much money uh, into the, the colleges around the country, in essence, it's allowed them, through the government takeover of tuition, uh, to raise uh, tuition even higher. Um, so we've got to get a lot smarter than the way this has been handling. I think we need to inject competition back into uh, the, the whole tuition process and not have the federal government in charge of it all. Um, and I also think relative to education, the federal department of education, parents, teachers, and local school boards ought to be running education uh, in this country, not the nameless, faceless bureaucrats up in Washington. Congressman, thank you. And your rebuttal? Again, we, we heard no ideas, no plans, no solutions for college affordability. Uh, there's just, there's, there's not much there. Mr. Shabbat has nothing. He's got nothing on this issue, nothing on a whole host of issues, and he, he seems to be offended that his constituents would hold him responsible after electing him for, for uh, over two decades in Congress. Well, Mr. Shabbat, who else are we supposed to turn to? You're our elected leader. You're our voice. You're supposed to be fighting for us. And instead, we have very little to show for your time there. Now, I, I do not live in Ohio, so I have no dog in your hunt. I am a Kentucky girl. However, I have a bunch of kids who are now heading to college, unfortunately, the first one. And it is expensive. So may I please take this opportunity one more time to clarify exactly what your plans are? Because I heard a little bit from both of you. Um, but if you could just take a few seconds, if you could, yeah. maybe 30 seconds, if we could, to just go ahead and tell us exactly your plan to make it more accessible. Very clearly. Students should be able to borrow money at the same rates that banks do, or at least we should pass legislation saying that students should be able to, to borrow money at mortgage rates at the very least. And second, I would expand Pell Grants. Thank you. Congressman? Don't have the federal government controlling tuitions and the rates in this country because they can set anything they want, and we as taxpayers are paying for it. Get competition back in where different banks have to compete for your business that brings uh, the rates down. Sin, are you satisfied as well? With that answer? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. I do appreciate sure. that. Uh, Jason, you have the next question. It is going to, I'm sorry, Congressman Shabbat, I do believe. Congressman Shabbat, um, <clears throat> President Trump has announced he wants to eliminate birthright citizenship for babies of non citizens and unauthorized immigrants, a move many experts would say, many experts say, would violate the 14th Amendment. This comes as the president has sent troops to the border to stop what he calls a, quote, invasion by a caravan of migrants from Central America. Question, do you support Trump's proposal to end birthright citizenship, one, and then two, and what should the U.S. do about the caravan or others seeking asylum at the border or hoping to enter it in other, <clears throat> for other reasons? He may not give you a straight answer. I will. Yes, I do support that. Um, we are a compassionate nation. However, I don't think our founders nor the 14th Amendment signers, uh, when they signed the 14th Amendment, had in mind, they, what they had in mind at that time uh, was that it was right after the Civil War, after the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, we had slaves in this country, and what they wanted to do was say, if you were born here, you're a citizen. They didn't mean people sneaking across the border from, from Mexico or a caravan coming up from 
Honduras or Guatemala or any, and by the way, I've been to those. He says I always travel around the world and all that kind of stuff. Yes, I was there in Guatemala and Honduras and met with the cardinal down there and met with programs where they're trying to interdict with the drug gangs that are trying to take their kids. So number one, what we need to do is to improve the conditions down there as much as possible so that the parents don't send their kids uh, up here. Um, so, so yes, I, I do support that. What was the second part of the question? Second question, second question is, uh, what should the U.S. do about the caravan or others seeking asylum at the border or hoping to enter for other reasons? We have a yeah. ridiculous policy right now with respect to asylum. What happens is the, the coyotes, the people bringing these people up here, um, essentially tell them the words to use, and they say that I have fear of this or that, when in essence the vast majority of them are just trying to get away lousy conditions to live in or a difficulty in finding employment down there. So improve the conditions down there. But we're a sovereign nation. And I hope this doesn't come to some sort of physical confrontation at the border. I think that we ought to put pressure on the Mexican government uh, to, to deal with it there rather than at our border. But when President Trump talks about a wall, and I've been to the, the, the ones that are going to be built, the companies compete on this, did you see how they pushed over those so-called walls down there and fencing? The crowds just came and pushed them over, violent, and that's what they're going to do with our southern border. So President Trump, I believe, is right about this, this wall. Thank you so much. Do you need the question to repeat it, or are you okay? Uh, I'm okay. okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, thanks so much for this question. It's an important one. And, you know, frankly, President Trump is as likely to end birthright citizenship as Mr. Shabbat is to come up with a plan for the Western Hills Viaduct. It's just not going to happen. First and foremost, it's unconstitutional. Republicans and Democrats agree on that. Uh, I, I, of course, don't support it uh, because it's unconstitutional, because it's impractical, and frankly, because it's not going to happen. And instead of engaging in these distractions, uh, these, these arguments that aren't based in reality or based in our Constitution, we should be talking about how we can actually fix a broken immigration system. We should be talking about common sense and bipartisan ideas, but most importantly, we have to come up with a comprehensive plan. We can't just take one piece and address that one piece one year and another piece another year. That's what we've been doing for years and years. We've been kicking the can down the road. We have to come up with a plan, and then we have to implement that plan. And the good news is it's straightforward. I agree, we have to strengthen our southern border. We have to do that. But we have to do it in ways that are cost-effective, but most importantly, effective. And that means investing in 21st century technology to strengthen our border and keep people who cannot be in our country because they are dangerous and because they're not going to be law-abiding or productive to our community. We have to keep them out, absolutely. But we have to come together and come up with a way for those who are here, who work for it, who are productive, law-abiding, who are contributing to our community and to the strength of our country, we have to have a place for them here. We have to provide them a pathway to citizenship. That's the way forward. Both Republicans and Democrats agree on that issue, but we have career politicians in D.C. continuing to tear us apart on this issue, failing in leadership, failing to move us forward. Any rebuttal? Yes. As taxpayers, I would suggest that you keep something else in mind. The social services that, that we have to pay as taxpayers for the people coming here illegally are costing tremendous amounts of money that aren't going to American citizens. Things like having to provide their education, providing for their health care, uh, and oftentimes they commit crimes and are in, involved in our criminal justice system. Who can forget Kate Steinle? Um, there are American citizens who literally have been killed by illegal immigrants in our country, and we have a right, we have a responsibility uh, to protect the people of this country. I will, Mr. Pureval is for Sanctuary cities and amnesty. It's a big difference. Jill, your question, and it goes to Mr. Pierval. Thank you. Thank you. The economy of the Cincinnati region depends heavily on international trade. Do you believe the policies President Trump's administration has pursued are beneficial or detrimental to businesses here at home? I think the policies have been a real challenge, have been a detriment to our businesses and our communities here at home. Trade has to be a priority for our national economy and for our state economy. It has to be a priority here in Ohio for the simple fact that we make things here in Ohio, thanks to great companies like GE, 
uh, Procter & Gamble, and Chevy. So we have to make sure that Ohio manufacturing can thrive. And we also have to be eyes wide open about the fact that foreign countries, including China, have been taking advantage of us for years, that our trade agreements with China have not been benefiting American workers and American jobs. But the way to fix that isn't by dictating trade policy through hostile tweet. It's by coming together with our trading partners and making sure that we have trade agreements that work for American workers and American jobs. And this has to be a priority right now. Because in the last 15 or so years, Ohio has lost 250,000 manufacturing jobs. Because of NAFTA alone, we've lost 50,000 jobs. We need fair trade, and we need a leader who will stand up to that. And again, these, these, these trade policies that President Trump have put forth that Mr. Shabbat, I believe, supports, they aren't doing that. They aren't protecting American workers. They're not protecting American jobs because they seem to be all over the place and not consistent and not clearly thought through, they're putting our local farmers and our local manufacturers in, in, a, in real trouble. Uh, and so that's why we have to be clear about our trade strategy, our trade policies, in order to make sure that Ohio manufacturing, that small businesses, that farmers can compete in not just a national economy, but in a global economy. Congressman? Yeah, I tend to be a free trader, have been most of the time uh, on most issues. Um, I happen to be on the Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, Mr. Pierval criticized me for traveling around the world and that sort of thing. But that's the type of thing that we're doing there. We're meeting with our counterparts in those countries to do what we think is good for American jobs, for the American people. Um, that's what those types of things are, are about. Um, as far as uh, President Trump, I was a bit skeptical. Uh, of him, and I think the chamber has been, and others, about uh, some of the tariffs that he was talking about, whether it was steel tariffs or aluminum tariffs, um, and, and I was a bit skeptical, um, as I have on a number of things he's either done or said, but I have to, you can't disagree with success. He's had some great examples. I'll give you, a, NAFTA is, is a good example. Um, you know, I was essentially for NAFTA. There were some things I would have made differently, and I wasn't in Congress uh, yet when, when NAFTA uh, passed, but would have probably supported it. I did support CAFTA, which was Central America, and the, and the free trade agreement with, with Africa and, and South Korea and a number of other the free trade agreements we've had over time. And generally, I think they're good for our country. It was for TPP and TTIP, which is with the, with the Europeans. Um, but what we've seen is on NAFTA, the president, I think, is getting a better deal. You know, it's called something different now. Instead of CAFTA, it's the USMCA, which the US, United States, Mexico, and Canada. It's a better agreement for us. I, I have to admit, I was a bit surprised he was able to get it done, but he did. And what it does, for example, when cars are being made, it used to be 62.5% had to be American-made parts in those cars. Now he got it up to 75%. That means more jobs for more Americans. Our dairy farmers had a hard time getting our products into Canada. They were able to block them. Um, now we can, our dairy farmers will be able to get in there. And he's also been able to strengthen intellectual property rights. Uh, the Chinese have been ripping us off for years. And he's being tough with China. And it's about time because it's easy for them to get their products in here, but tough for us to get our products into China. Thank you. Mr. Yeah, I think trade's incredibly important to our economy uh, because of what it does for our jobs and also our wages. And, and the truth of the matter is, working class and middle class families in our community are really struggling. And instead of focusing on that, focusing on wage inequality, Mr. Shabbat voted for this tax bill that gave 83% of the benefit to the richest 1% and blew a $1.9 trillion hole in our deficit. And the leaders of his party, Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan, have said that they, in order to fill that hole, they're going to come after Social Security and Medicare, asking senior citizens to pay for a tax break for billionaires and millionaires. But that's consistent with his stance. He's on record wanting to privatize Social Security, voting to increase the age to 70, supporting uh, an age tax that would make medicine more expensive for those over 55. Send me to Congress and I'll fight for fair trade, better wages, and stand up for your Social Security. Virtually everything you just said is baloney. It's just not true. Uh, we're doing pretty good on time. I do appreciate you guys sticking to uh, the time frame. It does make my job a lot easier. Uh, we need to go ahead and go to the closing statements. You each will have three minutes, and we're going to begin with Abtep Purval. A year ago, I never imagined I'd be standing here. I didn't expect to run for Congress. I was enjoying myself serving as your Hamilton County Clerk of Courts. 
making real change in real people's lives. We cut waste. We applied P&G management techniques to reduce the size of government, make it more efficient. We treated our employees with dignity, paying them a living wage and giving them comprehensive paid family leave. And we, most importantly, after doing all that, saved you, the taxpayer, nearly a million dollars. I'm really proud of the fact that we made promises and we kept those promises. But at the end of the day, I'm running for Congress because Washington is toxic and broken and dysfunctional. And we can't create change unless we, unless we change the people we send there to represent us, unless we step into the arena and demand something better. And we're a week away from this election. And you, the voters, have a profound choice. If you think Washington's working, if you think you're getting your fair share, if you think Congress is on your side, then you have your option. If you think health care is working fine, the Western Hills viaduct is in great shape, that you don't mind a congressman that won't meet with you, that won't have live town halls, who's been in Congress for 22 years, and who lives for the status quo, then you have your options. But if you believe we can do better, if you believe we deserve better, then I'm asking you to consider making a change. When I'm out in our communities campaigning, I'll run into little boys and little girls who are so optimistic about the future of our country. And oftentimes they'll tell me that they too want to one day serve their community through public service. I love that. We need to give people a vision of government that's optimistic, that reminds people that in America, everyone can come together and no one gets left behind. We need to start electing leaders who understand the values and virtues and vision that our country stands for. Because our country is great. It's special. Because for the simple fact that in America, anything is possible. Our limits are boundless. I'm Aftab Pureval, and I'm asking for your vote because I know our best days are ahead of us, and we can move our country forward together, not just for some of us, but for all of us. Thank you. Th thank you for watching uh, the debate this evening, and let me just say up front, I would greatly appreciate your vote next Tuesday, uh, November 6th. You know, I've lived here my whole life. I was born in a trailer park in Reading. Uh, when I was six years old, we moved to an apartment uh, in Price Hill. And uh, we lived in Westwood for more than 50 years. We've raised our family here. My wife, Donna, who's in the audience here, uh, graduated from UC. Uh, our daughter, Erica, graduated from UC's DAP program. It's a really good program, by the way. Um, I was a school teacher, as I mentioned, in the West End, uh, just down the street from Taft High School. Uh, I practiced law, served on city council, was a county commissioner, and I've had the great honor of serving this community in the United States Congress uh, for quite a few years now. Now, my opponent, Aftab Pureval, runs around saying I haven't done anything uh, for 22 years, uh, nothing to show for it, according to him. Uh, well, he doesn't know. He hasn't been here. He moved into our district the day before he announced he intended to represent us in Congress. And he was looking at the other district again, I might add. He just wants to be in Congress, doesn't care who he's representing. He says I'm negative. He's the one being investigated for serious charges. He's lawyered up, hiding from the press, breaking more laws by sending spies, and get this, to trick me into giving him strategy and information about the next debate against him. Well, believe it or not, my strategy is pretty simple. If Tab, you could have asked me, uh, I'd have told you, just be honest and tell the truth. Greg Harris, a Democrat who ran against me twice for Congress and later served on city council, uh, said several times in the debates that he and I had against each other that I was the most honest politician in town, Republican or Democrat. Charlie Lucan, another Democrat who was our mayor and I'd run against his father, Tom, for Congress before that, said the same thing. That's why the people of this community have reelected me over the years, because I am honest and hardworking, not flashy, and have accomplished a great many things for this community. And I'm not done yet. FTAB ridicules me for having represented this community for a long time, claiming I haven't accomplished anything, and that's okay. It's not true, but I can take it. But what I resent is that he's cynically insulting you, all the voters of this district, for electing and re-electing me. 
Obviously, I think you've been making the right choice over the years. But Mr. Ambition over here, he thinks he's smarter than all of us. Thank you. That concludes tonight's debate. You go ahead and give him a round of applause if you'd like. We do want to uh, thank the University of Cincinnati, the Cincinnati Enquirer, the Chamber of Commerce, and the African American Chamber of Commerce. We also like to thank our panelists. You guys did a great job tonight. We do appreciate it. Um, Good luck to you. Good luck to you. Thank you so much for a wonderful evening. Don't forget, get out there and vote on Tuesday, November 6th. You all have been wonderful. Thanks so much for being a wonderful audience. We do appreciate it. All right. Have a good night, everyone.